Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. What a blessing. Well, it, it was 27 degrees outside earlier, so it's a def definite fall day. And by the end of this week, we'll be into December. Emphasis on the burr. And as you know, Christmas is busted out everywhere for the last month. And now that Thanksgiving is behind us, it's a full court press all the way to Christmas. I feel the gloom and doom sinking in the room. Oh no. Well, we've started decorating. How about you? Getting ready for the biggest birthday party in the whole world. So don't get all bah humbug on me. It's Jesus' birthday. Don't let anybody else be a substitute. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this morning, the opportunity to be here, to read your word, to worship you, and to declare your worth, to commit ourselves to you by even the last song, all I have is yours. And Lord, that's our desire, to honor you. And Lord, with all our heart, we want to worship you. I pray that you help us to do that now as we give attention to your word, as we give it the reverence in which it deserves something which is a living document which will live on beyond us. I pray that you might help us to see what you have for each one of us here today, that you, by your spirit, by your word, would speak to our hearts and mold us more into the image of your son. So Lord, we dedicate ourselves and this time to you. Guide us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are back in Hebrews chapter 9. Last week we were in chapter 8. And we saw in all the preceding chapters that Jesus is greater than. He is greater than everything. The fathers, the prophets, the angels, than man, and Moses, than the high priest, than the Sabbath. He's greater than Joshua. He's a better deliverer. He's a better sacrifice than animals. That he's better in every way. He's a better temple. He's a better sacrifice. He's a better everything. He's greater than Melchizedek, and he comes from the order of Melchizedek, which isn't attached to Aaron at all. And he's greater than the old covenant because he makes that which is new, which is permanent and forever, and it's based on grace. And aren't you glad for that? God's grace is unmerited favor in which we don't deserve and certainly can't earn. He gives to us for the asking and he changes us from the inside. So that's the beauty of the new covenant. Basically, <clears throat> Hebrews is Jesus is greater. He's greater than all of these things. The author trying to communicate to a Jewish population who has come to know Jesus Christ as their Messiah and saying, hey, don't go back. The temptations are great because it's difficult being a Christian in that culture. It's difficult, but it's worth it because Jesus has renovated the whole system and you just can never go back. Jesus is greater. We looked at all of the warnings that are in the scriptures. We're, we don't have one for chapter 9, so we won't be there. But uh, next week we'll get to chapter 10, another difficult passage in Hebrews. Um, but these are the warnings we're told about about drifting, doubting, disobedience, dull of hearing, departing, despising, and denying the Lord and everything that he's done for us. And so we've been going through that. Last week we talked about the new covenant and how the old covenant was outdated and done because it was a picture and a shadow of what God ultimately would do by sending his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Just wanted to make sure you're with me. So this week we're going to be in chapter 9, where we look at the blood of Christ and how his sacrifice, his priesthood, is better in every respect. As we begin in verse 1. <clears throat> then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances, those, those are rules, of divine service and the, er, uh, and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part of which was the lampstand, the table, of showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which 
were golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things. We cannot now speak in detail. That sounded like a lot of detail to me right there. (laughs) What he's trying to say is there's a whole lot more to say about every single one of those things and the construction of this tabernacle. Excuse me. If if you guys aren't aware, it just sounds like a a list of, uh, you know, it's like stuff in your house that you have to ensure. You know, there's all of these things. But God prescribed up on the mountain on Sinai, when he gave Moses the law, he prescribed how to build this thing with very exact specifications. Uh, Now, when the engineer of all of heaven gives you exact directions, you should really follow them, especially when it comes to building something, because he knows how to build stuff. I mean, think about it. The earth, which hangs on nothing, and, and how our solar system is perfectly balanced and nobody runs into each other. I like that. So when God gives directions on how to make something, it's important. And it's more important because it's a shadow and a picture of the true temple, which is actually in heaven. And so as God communicates all this, the author is trying to tell us what it's like. And he's explaining to his Jewish audience who understands all this, uh, and probably some of us who are Gentiles, what in the world this is. This is how man met with God. This is how you were to be made right with God and how you deal with your sin problem. Any of you have a sin problem? Oh, good. Just a few of you. Good. Um, Then I'm in good company. This is how God met with you. and This is how you met with God. If you were in the Old Testament, if you were a Jew, one of God's people, you were called to obey everything that the scripture wrote and you were to go to This tabernacle, in fact, all of Israel, the tabernacle and the temple are two different things. And there's more than one temple. I don't want to get confused. But the tabernacle was in the wilderness when they left Egypt and they came out. The Lord said, this is what I want you to do and set up camp. And they set this tabernacle up, which was a a modern marvel. So he's trying to explain what this is. If you see the picture on the screen you'll see this sort of fence. It's made out of linen cloth, which wraps all the way around the outside. It's held together by brass poles, which are inside of silver sockets on the ground. So this isn't, uh, and each one of these sockets weighed about 100 pounds to hold up the fence. So this is a big deal. And even the cords and and the posts or the nails that would go in All of this was specified exactly as God wanted it to be. The exact size that you see here, uh, at least modeled on the stage. So you walk in, and by the way, there's only one door, and it faces east. And that was prescribed by God that you would walk into this door. And as you walk in, you'd see this inner courtyard. And the first thing you get hit with is this large brass, uh, sorry, brazen grate on top of a, a box And it's all overlaid with bronze. That's where the sacrifice that you bring is going to get sacrificed and burned. And that fire is never to go out according to Leviticus. It's always to be there. You would have a priest that greets you at the door. You would come with a perfect lamb of one years old, a male. Sometimes it's not so good to be a male. And bring them in and would have to be sacrificed. Once a year on Passover, Yom Kippur, the the priest would take this from your hand, bind it up, put it on a nearby area and sacrifice it as you put your hands upon it so that your sin, whatever it is uh, that's going on in your life, would be covered. And this is what God does as a picture of Jesus who would ultimately come the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So this whole thing is so detailed and so contrived and you go, why would God make it so hard? It's like, I want you to run around the tree and then I want you to climb on a roof and then I want you to slide down the downspout and then I want you to go in the front door, but I don't want you to go far, just three feet and then come out and then like, what in the world? It it just seems like so much detail. There's a reason. Because every single facet of this structure speaks of Jesus Christ. And I want to show you as we get into it, because it's, it's rather amazing. 
once you get into the courtyard, you have to make a sacrifice first thing. You, you can't go any further unless you make a sacrifice. And isn't it like that with our lives? You come before God and the Lord says, are you ready to present everything? Amen. Are you ready to give your life? Are you ready to give this up? Are you ready to sacrifice? That's the first thing you have to do. You've got to have a humble heart to come to God and say, listen, I need you. And there's, there's nothing I can do on my own. And I need to meet with you and in the way you prescribe. That's the first step of salvation. Then you come to this little structure that you see in the back, which is rather interesting because the walls are made out of gold. Gold over the top of acacia wood. Acacia wood actually is a, a desert plant. Acacia, it's the same sort of plant that was on fire when Moses went up and he says, what in the world is this? It was an acacia bush, but it wasn't burned up if you remember. So, this material in which is put up once was alive, but isn't alive now and is covered over with gold. Hmm, that's rather interesting. Why would God choose that? Well, it's interesting. Acacia only lives in desert areas. It's a desert plant and it grows up and has a tender root in, in this dry place. It's a rather interesting picture of who Jesus is. It's, in fact, we see that in Isaiah 53, but I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. You're going to come in and you're going to see this building if you were to walk into it. And it's overlaid with all of these covers. But the one that's on the outside is just bland. It looks like, like a grayish brown leather. And it doesn't look like much. And what it's covering are these walls of gold where the gold has been overlaid over the acacia. And it's about seven foot high. And the building is 30, it's 45 feet long and 15 feet wide. And in it are two rooms. The first room is called the holy place. Only the priests were allowed to go in here. You couldn't go in. I couldn't go in. Only the priests are able to go into the holy place. They go in and they make sure that this little light right over here keeps shining. This is a seven-standed um, lampstand. It's actually made out of one piece of gold. Somebody had to hammer this thing and it has leaves and it looks like a vine and it's, it's intricate and there's basically one lampstand, but then there are six branches that come off of it. So you have this thing as you might know as a menorah, right? Except this has seven instead of 12, like you might see 12. So here's the, here's the one source of light in this very first room and you can imagine it bouncing off the gold walls. So it's kind of like amplified inside of there. And then if you look to the right, there's what's called the table of showbread. It's like a little side table and they would put 12 pieces of bread on there commemorating God's provision for the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there's the 12 loaves of bread, which is, there's a special recipe and nobody's supposed to copy it. So I'm not going to tell you the ingredients, <laughs> but it's in the scripture and it's interesting. It's, uh, it's, it's made out of, well, you, you look that up. Anyway, so you go into that. Now you walk a little bit further and the back room is a 15 by 15 room and it has this veil, a second veil. The first one you walk into to get to the holy place. The second one, which only the high priest can go in and only once a year and not without a sacrifice for his own sin because he's coming into the very presence of God. This veil would be moved, or before you move that, by the way, there's a solid gold table where they would burn incense. And that incense is a picture of prayers of the saints. And scripture talks about that in Revelation, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all over. So there's this incense. He would take, the high priest would take it and put it in a censer. He would put it in one of these, if you've been to the Catholic church, you know, the... the the egg looking thing that's smoking on the chain. It's like that. And so what they would do is they would take a coal from that and put it in, burn the, this incense. And then he would be able to go into the Holy of Holies, which is this 15 by 15 room. Once in there, he brought blood and it was be sprinkled on this gigantic chest that's in the middle of the room. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant has two pieces. There's a lower section, which you, you might think looks like a coffin of some kind. It's a large box. And inside it, we know what's inside of it. There's a gold, golden bowl, which has 
manna in it or, or whatever's left of that manna because bread doesn't last long. And then there's Aaron's staff. If you remember, he went before and showed that he, God was with him. And so his staff, which is a dead piece of wood, actually sprouted, which is a miracle. And you have the Ten Commandments, which rest inside there. The lid of this box is called the mercy seat. Everybody say mercy seat. Mercy seat. Which you might say, never mind. The mercy seat sits on top of the law, and that's exactly where it belongs. This is where the blood would be spilled, and it's a solid gold lid that sits on top. And on top of that are two angels and their wings are spread and touching one another. And so there are all these details that God said, make sure you do this. And you say, wow, this is uh, some crazy religion right here. There's a lot of details involved. The priest would then go in and he would bring the, the censer and he would sprinkle the blood and he would walk around. And if, if he wasn't in sin or so hiding something, he would live. If not, they would drag his dead carcass out by the rope that's tied around his ankle. They actually put bells on these guys as they went in so they could listen to see if God struck them dead or not. Because if you hear a thud and no more bell sound, you know you got a bad dude you know, doing, doing the service. And they drag his carcass out because you don't dare go into the presence of the Lord because you'll be next. And God reveres his presence and he reveres all of these things because he protects his glory. So that when Jesus comes, it's not contaminated and messed up. So that's what the author is talking about in all of these verses that you and I perhaps may not be very well acquainted with. But every single one of these things points to Jesus Christ. This is what it looks like if you're looking from above. Here's the one door that you have, and of course it's facing east. And here's the altar of sacrifice, which is made with bronze. Bronze is actually the, uh, it's, it's two metals, it's copper and tin that are mixed together. It makes the copper uh, much less able to melt and it makes it harder. You don't care about that. Anyway, so here's the altar of burnt offering. So the first thing you need to do is make an offering when you come in. Then there's this, which is called the laver, which I didn't mention. Or the sea, they call it a sea. It's a giant jacuzzi. It's a bowl a convex bowl that is filled with many gallons full of water and what it's used for is washing. Now that's made out of brass and the brass would be highly polished so when you looked inside of it, you'd be able to see your reflection. It was actually made from all the women's mirrors that were taken from Egypt. They took them, melted them down and made them into the labor and it was a perfect mirror and the priests would go in and wash. You would wash, and then you'd be able to go in through the first. Then you have the table of showbread over here on the right. You have your menorah over here, and then you have your incense, your altar of incense, which actually moves if you read through the scriptures carefully, but we'll, we'll just move on. And then there's this veil that separates this holiest of holy places with the, with, uh, the presence of God, it is said that the presence of God would dwell between the cherubim, that this Shekinah glory, this light, this cloud, the way it's described, that God would dwell there. And only one guy, one day a year, would be able to go and meet with him on behalf of himself and the people. This is what the Jews once had and was prescribed by God, which they don't have anymore because they don't have a temple. Later on, it was turned into a temple, and it was uh, Solomon enlarged it and made it much grander, as you might expect, because uh, that's what people do, right? Yeah. It's always bigger and better when we get a hold of it. This is an artist's rendition of what it looked like, and all of Israel would camp around the outside of it. And there's a very particular way in which they were to camp. There were four divisions, and they had four standards, you know, like a big flag that would hang up there. And so they would all go and um, assemble north, south, east, and west exactly as God positioned them to be. And I'm, I'm not going to get into all of that, but because it's a lot, and I know I'm overwhelming you. One thing I want you to realize is there's only one way in. That seems very exclusive. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Amen. Interesting. So this points to Jesus Christ. We've got one door. We also have this linen enclosure, by the way, is completely white, gleaming white. They made sure that they kept it clean on, on these brass poles in these silver sockets. Silver is an interesting metal. You'll notice all throughout the scripture it's used similar. It's about redemption. If you had a firstborn and you had to go redeem them, you could redeem them with silver. If you remember Jesus, when he was turned in, he was betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. silver. It's the price of redemption, and it's throughout all of the scripture. And it's amazing that every single one of these things sits in a silver socket. <clears throat> because there is no other foundation that can be laid other than the one that's been laid, which is Christ Jesus. So you have these brass poles, which there's about a hundred of them, and uh, that's what keeps everything up. You've got these silver sockets, which are pictures, and you have cords and nails, all of which are designed by God to be a picture of who Jesus is and what he once would go through. This is another artist's rendition of what it looks like. So here's, here's the altar that you would come up against, and it would be covered in bronze, you would have four horns on it. It's all made out of one piece. It's acacia wood that's been overlaid. Uh, those, those horns, if you read through the scripture, you'll see there are a lot of people go up there and grab onto them and it doesn't matter. They get killed anyway. But the brazen altar of sacrifice, brass is always the picture of judgment. You remember when Moses makes this snake and he hangs it on a pole, it's made out of brass. It's the picture of judgment or fire. So if you go through the scripture, you'll see God uses these pictures and idioms all through the scripture. The laver or the sea, this one's drawn a little bit small, and it would be incredibly bright and shining. And it was a place where you could wash, uh, where the priests would wash on a continual basis. It's, uh, it's interesting because there are no specifications given for the size of the laver. It's the only thing that God didn't give a dimension for, which means you can make it as big as you want. What does water symbolize in the scriptures? Could be the spirit of God, but it's the word of God. It's like, a, I, I thirst for you like, a, like a, a deer that pants for water. It's the word of God. If you look in Ephesians 5, uh, many other places, you know, the washing of water by the word. And so it's, it's interesting because here they wash in it and they're, they're washing in, the, in this laver slash sea. Some people, some scriptures call it the sea. Do you know in Revelation there's a sea as well? It's called a sea of glass. And where are the saints? They walk upon it. Isn't it interesting that the saints will be standing upon this sea, which is the word of God. We'll be standing on the word of God. Anyway, Amen. there's all of these pictures as we go through here. The very first coating over the top of this holy place and the, and the holy of holies is made out of linen which has scarlet and purple and blue and it has a picture of angels on it so it's incredibly ornate so any of you who think that if you're an iconoclast you'd really have a problem here because there's a lot of ornate stuff that's ha that's hung inside here so that could only be seen from inside because the next layer is a bunch of goat skins all sewn together and laid over the top of that. And you say, well, it seems like you ruined it. You know, you had a nice kind of a convertible feel with the, uh, with the, the, the linen up on, above you and all these colors, and now you ruin it by putting all these goat skins. Well, if you know what a scapegoat is, you'll know how important it is that something which carries your sin away is actually pictured here. And so the sacrifice of Jesus is pictured, along with the ram skins, that are dyed red. Why would you take a ram skin and dye it red? It seems highly particular. And yet it's a picture of what Abraham did when he took his son Isaac up. And it says there was a ram that was caught in the thicket and the ram became the substitute. And he called it the Lord shall provide. Jehovah Jireh. He called it that place. A picture and a foretelling of Jesus Christ coming and sacrificing himself. That the Lord himself will provide a lamb. And on top of that, you have these porpoise skins which look like kind of a grayish brown leather. Uh, in some versions, it says uh, badger skins. 
uh, but there's, there's some um, discussion about that. But porpoise skins were used for lots of things. It, they were used for shoe leather, especially. In fact, it's the same kind of shoe leather that the Israelites had when they went through the wilderness and they didn't wear out. So there's this durable, kind of ugly looking cap that goes on everything. And I think about Jesus in Isaiah 53, it says that he had no beauty or comeliness that we should be attracted to him. So there are all of these pictures of who Jesus ultimately would fulfill. Here's the sanctuary and all the gold panels that you would see on the outside. And then there are these gold bars that would hold it together. They would put these um, pieces. It's acacia wood covered with gold. That thing which once was living, which is wood, is now covered over with gold. A picture of Jesus' kingship and also his life and death. You have the very first veil in which you had to go through, which kept everybody else out except for the priesthood. And you know that we're separated from God because of our sins. And we don't have the ability to go before him without a whole lot of preparation that these guys would have to go through. We have it easy because we accept a free gift. Jesus went and did all of this so that we could have salvation and not go through all of this. Can you imagine? There's a whole lot of stuff to do. You think it's hard to come to church and sit and listen. <laughs> and here's that seven stick menorah that, that's over here. It's interesting. Jesus has seven I am statements in the book of John. One of the things he says is, I am the light of the world. He says, abide in me and I abide in you. Since you can, I am the vine and you are the branches. Isn't it interesting? Six is always the number of man. And this is seven, which it's one candlestick made out of one piece. It's actually not a candlestick. It's a lampstand. So it's like man being the branches and Jesus is the center. So there are all of these wonderful pictures, the showbread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never die. You have all of the I am statements of Jesus being fulfilled. He said, I'm the door. I'm the door to the sheepfold. And there's no other way to go. And anyone who goes in another way is a thief and a robber. Interesting. And he says, he who climbs in some other way, referring to the white linen on the outside. So all of these things should point us to Jesus. So this is the holy place. There are oil lamps that are always to be lit. They're always to be fortified so that the light never goes out. This, the oil that's inside of it is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we need to keep oil in our lamps like the virgins. You know, there were some that had oil and some that did not. and They had to go get it. This is a big thing. I'm trying to get through it very quickly. The table of showbread, relying upon the Lord that you are my shelter. You are my fortress. I will not be afraid. It's about God being able to provide for you and taking care of you as a remembrance of what God's done in the past. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Amen. The golden altar of incense, which is symbolic of prayers. Do, do you realize that in the book of Revelation, it has the same thing? That incense, which is the prayers of the saints. You'll see all of these pictures. Once you get the Old Testament and you run through some things in the New Testament, you'd be like, oh, oh that reminds me of... That's why the Lord did it. And then there's this second veil, which only the high priest would go in and only once a year and only after he had sacrifices. So it's a, this is a big giant ceremonial thing. And then there's the box, the box with the angels. And it says that the Lord dwells between the cherubim or over the cherubim, uh, it's the mercy seat, which I'm glad for because in, inside of it's the law. And I don't know about you, but even if you just take the Ten Commandments, I don't measure up. How about you? So you know what? I need God's mercy <laughs> over that. You know what happens if you open that box? Well, if you watched Indiana Jones, <laughs> they actually pick up on a truth. There were some, it had gotten taken by a bunch of unbelievers and there were crazy things that happened. And so they sent it back on a cart and said, we got to get rid of this thing. And they sent it back. When it came back, they wanted to know if the Babylonians ripped them off and took the stuff out. And so they opened the lid and guess what happened? 15,000 of them died. Because you know what happens when you look at the law without God's mercy? You die. 
So the mercy seat is over the top. Thank God for that. And that's where the blood is spilled, and it's a this solid gold lid. Um, it's quite an effort. In fact, as it was being transported back to Israel, they had a great idea. Let's build a cart, just like these guys sent the thing back. We'll build a cart and put it on a cart, and the cart kind of tipped, and it started to go off the cart, and there was a guy who stuck his hand out, Uzzah, and the Lord took his life because he reverences this, not among the unbelievers, but among the believers he does. So judgment begins with the household of God. So you've got the holiest place, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the box down below, and you have the mercy seat, which is down up on top of it. You have the angels uh, being the, the messengers of God, and then you have these poles, which are be put in, because this thing was never to be transported on a cart. It was always designed to be carried by people, because the presence of God was never meant to be in a thing. It was meant to be held by people. The spirit of God that is in you, isn't that the same? You carry the spirit of God inside of you if you're his. So the Solomon's temple was a much bigger deal and they just, it was a 2.0 situation. So they made it much bigger. I won't get into that. So those are the first five verses. Here we go. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services making sure that there was oil, making sure the bread got changed out. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now it says committed in ignorance because if you did something willful, you had to make a sacrifice and go get it right, right away. You don't wait and just say, well, I got that one sacrifice so I, I, could, I could rack up some sin before I get there. It wasn't like that. There's this ceaseless work of sacrifice and bloodshed on behalf of the priests because people were constantly sinning. You get that? Yeah, yeah I know. I'd, I'd be a frequent flyer. Limited access. There was only one place. There was only one priest that could do this, uh, that would go into the, the most holy place. And it, they would come before God only one man once a year. So this is a highly regulated, highly elite thing that we as Christians just take for granted that we can talk to God right away. You could stop everything you're doing and say, God, and he says, yes. Amen. You don't have to do all of this. But imagine being a Jew and having done all this all of your life and then finding out that Jesus was the sacrifice who came and he was the high priest who came and he is the light of the world. He's the bread of life. He is the one door. He is all of that in which was pictured and you don't have to do that. You can come before the Lord. Some of us have trouble doing that, don't we? Amen. If I do something wrong, if I, if I sin against God in my mind, in my heart or my words or you know, one of you good people I might hurt, I, I feel like I have to beat myself up. How about you? I got to, you know, maybe not physically, but, you know, I'm going to beat myself up good and black and blue until I suffer for my sins. Because that's the only way to get over it, right? <laughs> it's the only way I'm going to change. After I ate an entire pizza, I punched myself in the belly. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I haven't eaten an entire pizza in a really long time. So I could use that as an example. But... You get the idea that this is a very busy place. It was very much not like what you and I know, that Jesus Christ is our high priest, that he is our sacrifice, that he is our temple. And you actually become inspired by the spirit of God who lives inside of you. This is a very different economy in the new covenant, a much better, I would, I would say far more than 2.0. And the Holy Spirit indicating this, that by the way of the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. It's not talking about Martin Luther or 
Swingley or he's not talking about that reformation. He's talking about until the new covenant was to come. And so all of these things happened until Jesus came and it was a lot of busyness. And all of these things were symbolic to point to Christ so that when Jesus would come, you would think anybody who was practicing, a uh, practicing Jew would go, oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. But it didn't happen. And Jesus as our high priest comes and performs all of the duties by sacrificing himself, not an animal, which just covers things, which shows God that you're in earnest and you believe him when he tells you to do something and out of obedience, you do what he says. All of those people were playing a part in pointing us to Jesus. And I'm so glad that God did it, although it is complicated and intricate. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. He's talking about the one in heaven. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, Jesus sacrificed of himself and bled and died and comes before the tabernacle that's in heaven. Now that's something. And he does it once and he's done because it's his life and it's not some animal. And he offers it to us and that's how we get saved. That's how Jesus does a work in us and we become born again, as Jesus says in the book of John chapter three. So that's what happens to us all on behalf of what Jesus does for us. It's not what we can do. The, the best thing we can do is receive a free gift and you can't even do that until God eliminates your mind. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, there's a whole nother sacrifice thing, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, old covenant, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Did you hear what that said? Cleanse the conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ is destined and supposed to be effectual on our conscience. I don't know about you, but not just other people, but I beat myself up about things I've done in the past. The devil will come and whisper in my ear and I'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't be these people's pastor because I'm, I'm just a wicked, horrible, terrible human being. If they knew who I was, they wouldn't listen to a word I said. And yet the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our conscience. Amen. And you need to apply that blood <laughs> to your conscience. And sometimes I need a big reminder of that, that I'm forgiven and I'm free, not free to be a bonehead, but I'm free to serve God freely without the, the past looming over me or the backpack of bowling balls of all the things I've done. Jesus Christ will cleanse the conscience. Some of us need that. So, so Jesus is greater. He's a greater sacrifice all throughout the book of Hebrews. Paul gives us a demonstration of how this works out practically in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. He says, but with me is <clears throat> a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. <clears throat> you get that? For somebody to point their finger at me and judge me is a small thing. Even for a court to judge me un unrighteously so, is a small thing. It's a, it's a small thing because God sees, God knows. Some of us are people pleasers. I won't ask for a show of hands. Some of us are people pleasers. We need other people to be happy. You need to be happy with what I'm doing. Are you happy with me? Are you happy with what I'm doing? Are you, are you happy? I mean, really happy. I mean, are you bitter at all? Are you angry? Is there anything I can do to be nicer to you so that you like me and you love me and you accept me and you think I'm okay? Is there anything? I'm, I mean, really, because you know, I'm looking at you and I'm not getting anything back and I'm, I'm kind of curious. Is there, is there something really in the back of your mind, maybe just a little thing that's been troubling you and you know, you need to... Do
Paul says, listen, it's a small thing for anybody to say anything to me about anything. And he goes, I, I, I don't think I've done anything. I don't think there's anything currently in my life that's going on. He says, but that doesn't make me innocent. It just means I'm not convicted about it. So if you guys know something, let me know. I mean, other than I need to lose weight. I know that. You don't have to rush me at once. So there are things in which Paul says, it's a small thing for you guys to judge me. So he's not a people pleaser. He's a God pleaser. And he's free. His conscience is free. By the way, he orchestrated the death of people who serve Jesus. If that guy could be free in his conscience to say, listen, I, I'm not aware of anything that I'm doing currently that's against God's will, but that doesn't make me innocent. There might be something going on, but do you see how just chill he is and how free he is? Amen. That's an example of what a clean conscience looks like. Not because you beat yourself up enough, but because you came to Jesus, you asked for forgiveness, you offered repentance, and you walk in newness of life like the scripture says. I just think some of us don't walk that way. But Paul gives us a really good New Testament example. Verse 15. And for this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant. That's Jesus. By means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. So Jesus died not just for the New Testament saints, but the Old Testament saints. What they did by faith, Jesus was applied to them as well that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also be a necessity, be the death of the testator. I'll explain that. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. You know what a last will and testament is, right? Yeah. And that goes into effect once you're gone. So nobody could take your stuff until then. Right? But Jesus came and fulfilled everything that he was supposed to fulfill. And his last will and testament is to give you eternal life. Amen. And because he died, now we have the New Testament, which is basically his last will and testament to us who believe, which is eternal life. And we know for sure that it's taken because nobody home. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and there are, there's parallels in there too, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Can you imagine somebody sprinkling you with blood? And that's supposed to make you clean but there's a picture there, you see? <laughs> then likewise, he sprinkled with blood the tabernacle, all the vessels of the ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. In other words, there is no forgiveness of sin. There's no taking back or, or washing away your sin without the shedding of blood. This has been taught for years and years and years, and people turn it into all sorts of things. Well, the way that I get straight is I go to a meeting and I get in the meeting and that straightens me out and that makes me clear with God. No, that's not true. Well, you know what I do? I go, I go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist. I go and I lay on a couch and they say, how long have you been feeling this way towards your father? <laughs> that doesn't cleanse you of your conscience or of your sin. There are people that work, 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 work so that they don't have to think about their life. That doesn't clear you of your sin either. Doing good works and being a good person and being nice to everyone because you want them all to like you, that doesn't take away your sin either. The only thing that takes away sin is Jesus Christ and the shed blood on the cross. Amen. That's it. That's the one door. That's the bread we have to eat. That's the light of the world. That's the one. Amen. So how can you be cleansed and stand before God for eternity? It's something that Jesus did for you. It's not something that you do other than receiving a free gift. And how hard is that to do? It depends on how ugly the sweater is, I suppose. 
Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, by the way, all of these things are copies of what's in the heavens, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place, places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Do you see, Jesus did for us what you would never want to do for yourself. Although you could die for your sins, it's called an eternity in a place called hell. That always is an option, but not for me. So Jesus delivers us and he intercedes for us like the priest would intercede and go before God for the people. Jesus went into heaven for us, which is a much better place to go. And he does it once. And then he clarifies in verse 25, not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He would then have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. By the way, every time you sin, Jesus doesn't die again. Exactly. Every time you take communion, you're not killing Jesus again. I just want to be clear because there are some people that teach that. It's just not the case. It's just not the case. He died once for all and he said, it is finished. Amen. The debt is paid in full. But now, once at the end of the ages, 2,000 years ago, that's on, on the timeline of, of life, that's the end of the ages. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. You can understand how the author of Hebrews is writing to the Jews about their old religious format and he's comparing Jesus to this and saying, Jesus did it all. It's a done deal. You got no reason to go back there. Even though it might be difficult for you to claim yourself to be a Christian, maybe you risk your life. It's not worth going back because you see, they were all pictures and shadows. And who would exchange the reality of who Jesus is for a picture and a shadow? And yet we do that when we say, oh, well, I'm going to be good enough that God will love me. Well, then why would Jesus die? Why would he have to come in? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And there's nothing that you can add to the salvation that Jesus does. All we can do is receive it and then walk in newness of life. Amen. And so this temple, which was the very presence of God, where this, this Shekinah glory would come down and illuminate and show, was a remarkable thing. And when they were in the wilderness, it was just an amazing thing, I imagine. And having all of Israel distributed north, south, east, and west, and everything that that means, I'll probably get into that next chapter. But this is what people did to get right with God. And this is what God did to get us right with him. What we need to do is accept, which means, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm broken. I'm twisted. I got mental illness. I got stuff going on that only you know. And I give myself to you because I'm a broken toy and I got to get fixed. Yep. And I realize that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin, that he shed his blood, the lamb of God, that he was God, the son came down in himself. God came down in the person of his son to die for you. And all you have to do is confess and believe and follow. And Jesus will forgive you of your sin. And he will give you a new life from the inside out. And it's that simple. I'm not trying to sell you anything. You don't need to join Calvary Chapel. Uh, you don't need to join Grace Bible Fellowship. You don't need to join a church. You need to join with Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 53. Isaiah says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, who's believing this story? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, like an acacia. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him, much like porpoise skins. 
He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as you would expect any sacrifice. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. That's called shame. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and car carried our sorrows, unless you want to carry them. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, you remember he was whipped, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, all. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. And he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. That is the love of our God. And that is what Jesus did for each one of us. What a tremendous privilege. As the worship team comes up, pray with me. Father God, I thank you so much for your plan. Your plan that was so much simpler and yet so much more expensive than the Old Testament. I thank you, Lord, that you say that if we come to you in faith and accept you as our Savior, that you will save us. And there's nothing we add to your salvation. Lord Jesus, I thank you for being willing to sacrifice for us, willing to lay down your life for us, to leave heaven, to leave perfection, and imprison yourself in a human body and live like us to show us how to live. I pray, Lord, that you give us a heart that loves you. And as we celebrate the day of your birth as it comes quickly in December, I pray that we might have a renewed sense of who you are and what you've done for us, that you would enlarge our hearts, that you might sharpen our minds and help us to be more like you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.